One of the beautiful things about our Christian faith is that we adore him daily, not just on Christmas. So Christmas Day has come and gone. Um, we would say Merry Christmas then, and we say Happy New Year. Ooh, almost smacked her. <laughs> Happy New Year. So all I have for today is like Happy Sunday. Does that work? I don't know. It's the best I got. Yay, Happy Sunday. I got a map here too. Um, We've learned over the last so many weeks that Jesus Christ is yesterday, today, and forever. So really for believers, every day is Christmas if it means Jesus is present. And so we get to celebrate every day as Christmas really in that regard. But we are thinking about New Year's. We just are. I've been, you know, watching some shows on the last year, uh, reading media stuff, and Everybody all around the world is talking about the passing of this year, anticipating the new year. So so I'm going to talk about it today because it's sort of silly not to. It's really happening. And and many people are already making New Year's resolutions. And so here's what I think about it. When we think about the new year and we make resolutions, we're really charting a course. We really are. It's an adventure. I say that because the things we want to do are different than and better than the year that came. Isn't that the truth? We want to stop an old habit, develop a new habit. And and as I was thinking about it, I thought, what does that remind me of? And because I'm me and I love the ocean, it reminded me of going fishing. You're not making the connection. I'm going to make it for you. (laughs) I made the connection, I tell you. Look look up on your screen. I want to show you something. This, this, This map here is larger, the one on my hand, than the one on the screen. But really, it's a nautical map. And and when you're going fishing and you chart a course, what you do is you decide where you want to go and why you want to go there, right? You decide where you want to go and why you want to go there. What's the purpose and the goals of the day, of the trip? And so you chart it. Now, when I say chart it, today you punch in a GPS number and head out. But what we would do before GPS is we would use these on a nautical map. And you would fix them at a certain distance that, a, that was the same distance on a map. And you decide what your latitude and your longitude was. And then you plot this and you'd walk it down the map like this to have a constant space. And you'd measure how long you were on your course, what speed you were on your course, and what compass heading you were on. And that was called dead reckoning. Nowadays, GPS does all of that, but I have to say, I'm still a fan of dead reckoning because GPS can break. Things can go wrong. I also thought about when we go fishing, whether it's salmon in close or tuna way out, there's a number of things we have to be ready for when we do that. You need to know the waters. You have a map, like this map. You plot where you want to go. Then you have to know a lot about boats. You've got to know about fishing gear. You have to know about currents and drift and wind and swell buildup. You gotta know the weather that's coming. You gotta know if the wind comes up in the afternoon and which direction it's coming from. There's a lot that goes into it. You chart a course and it's a great adventure to go fishing. When you look at last year and decide to set new goals and resolutions for the coming year, you're charting a course. It's a similar adventure. First, you pray about and decide what you want to change, and then you go about that process. I found a very helpful book when I went fishing frequently. I've had a number of boats. This one's called The Complete Idiot's Guide to Boating and Sailing. What are you laughing about? I picked it because it somehow fit. And as the initial idiot, I read this thing and learned what I needed to know about boating, launching, coming back, being out there, how to navigate the rules of being on the ocean, all of that. It was a very, very, very important book. But today I'm also going to give you a little bit of history of this whole resolution process, New Year's resolutions, reflecting on the year that was, anticipating the year that comes. And I'm also going to give you a little bit of a people behavior research There's people who study how we behave and why. And I'm going to give you a little bit of that too. So let's do a little history. New Year's resolutions started with the Babylonians. Now, if you're a student of Old Testament history, you might have as your Babylonian experience simply the prophecies that Babylon's going to come and wipe out 
Jerusalem in 586 BC. But when we talk about resolutions, we're talking about the Babylonians millennium before that. And their year started in March. And they would actually, we have evidence of this, decide to do things differently, set resolutions. It was always about doing something good or improving. And this is going to be a quick trip through history. That year was March. Rome comes along centuries later and changes the year to January 1. Now, along with that came uh, uh, this god Janus, from which we get the word January. And if you notice about this god, there's a face looking this way and a face looking that way. The idea was this particular god would reflect on what had come before and gone before and look ahead to what's coming. Thus, the Romans had instituted this process of examine the year before, assess it, and make new decisions about the year that's coming. Now, that's God with a little G. We know that's not a real God. But that's where this process really took root of when the new year comes, look at what you want to do differently and make some commitments to that. Then we go to the, um, <coughs> excuse me, the fourth century Christians. What, because what had happened among the Romans is New Year's resolutions really collapsed into New Year's Eve partying and excuses to party. Not that that's going on anywhere today in our country, but it certainly has in ancient history. It's crazy, isn't it? Um, and they said, we've got to go back to fasting and praying. So there was a fourth century commitment to go back to teaching about fasting and praying. Fast forward again to, to our own Puritans, the people who left Europe to settle America. They didn't want any old habits that were about partying and getting away from fasting and praying to sort of infect what they were doing in the new land. So they made a strong commitment to make sure their kids didn't party and knew about fasting and praying. So you see how it's walking through the centuries. Then in the 1700s, there's an academic, a scholar, a brilliant man, brilliant theologian named Jonathan Edwards. Many of you may be familiar with him. If you're in seminary, you're going to study his work. In those 1700s, he took two years and wrote out very diligently and prayerfully 70 resolutions. I once, uh, about five or six years ago, preached on some of those here. And that takes us right up to today. So what are we talking about when we talk about New Year's resolutions? It literally is a time, and we're doing it now, where you reflect on the year before. What worked well that you want to keep? What do you not want to do anymore? What do you want to do better? What new thing do you want to add? It's about habits, isn't it, really? Getting rid of old habits <coughs> that aren't productive and installing new ones that are more productive. So habits, we are creatures of habit. There's no way around it. We're psychologically, neurologically wired for habits. It's God's design. Who would be willing to tell me, how many, tell me how many days you think it takes to create a new habit? 28, what else? 21, 28, what else? 12, 30? Okay, anybody want to go higher or lower? Seven. You're the only one who's wrong. I'm going, to put a, I'm going to put a number on the screen. Let me tell you what research says. <laughs> Habits take anywhere from 18 to 285 days. Congratulations. Everyone except that last one <laughs> is right. It takes a long time. I mean, our cognitive capacity gets full, and, and we're trying to stuff new things in and take old instinctive behaviors that have kind of our bodies and our mind involved, and it's tough to do. Uh, I go to the Monterey Sports Center about six days a week, and four days of the week, I'm out front about 5.22 to 5.24 a.m. Now, there's a reason I'm so precise. I don't want to go too early because I'm tired. <laughs> but I don't want to go too late because if you get too far back in the front door as you wait for it to open at 5.30, I won't get my choice locker. <laughs> I have a habit. There's a locker I want. There's two I'll settle for. Three that'll make do, and the rest, I just, it irritates me. <laughs> so I've been standing out front of this sports center doing that for probably 10 years, 
we know each other. We're the same people. The guy in the red is always first. He gets there. Some days he can't sleep. He gets there at 4 a.m. But what do we notice the day after Thanksgiving? We're chatting among ourselves. There's about 10 to 12 of us. We look around, there's like 50 people lined up. What the heck are these people doing here? Oh, yeah. Thanksgiving was the day before, the day of eating without restraint. Now they're going to exercise. Done. So as we chatted about this, we reminded ourselves that it happens every year. But we went on to remind ourselves that we can expect the true influx the day after New Year's. That'll be Friday this coming week. When people just start acting on those commitments to exercise and lose weight. And they're going to mob everything. We got to get there early. I'm going to get there at 519 to 520 a.m. Not that I'm too precise, but I am. Because I may not get my locker and I may not get my life cycle. But when do they go away? Any guesses? Middle of February, poof. Yeah, like magic, poof. They're gone. Now, that's not to criticize, but it's hard. Research tells us that anywhere from 50 to 60% of you and I will set a New Year's resolution. Another 20% will certainly think about it and kind of do it, but don't want to tie themselves to a commitment. Research goes on to say that about 8% will keep them for the whole year, 8%. Those are not good odds at all. And, and many, you know what it's become really though? It's called by a sociologist, the shared American hobby, making New Year's resolutions. You ever thought of it that way? What do you do? Well, I bowl. What do you do? I fish. Well, what do you do? I make New Year's resolutions and then fail them. Hey, fun hobby. But they call it the shared American hobby because why? It's something we putter at. We do now and then. It's an interesting thing. And as Christians, we do the same thing. We, I, I, it'd be fun to say it's not true, but it is true. I'm in a number of groups, two men's Bible studies, a Thursday morning group with men from four churches I've been in for almost 10 years, nine and a half years. And we do the same thing. I'm going to study the Bible. I'm going to read it more. I'm going to read the whole thing in a year. And we passed out one year the Bible in a year, Bible in one year, reading, you know, materials. We, we've done all this. It's been rare that we've kept them. Now, again, that's not a criticism, but I just want us to have a reality base here. It's hard to keep New Year's resolutions. It's hard to keep them. Now, I'm going to go back and look at what are the most common ones in America today. The New York Times prints a list of them every year, and I'm going to put them up on the screen there for you to see, all right? Number one, it's a no-brainer. Lose weight. Every year, it's lose weight, year after year after year. If it really worked, we wouldn't have to put it on again. <laughs> it's like, well, we don't need that one because we all lost the weight last year. It doesn't work. Number two is get organized. Why is it a resolution? Because I need to get organized. That didn't work last year either. Number three, spend less save more. Number four, enjoy life to the fullest. I have no clue how you measure that. I have a little more enjoyment today. I think I'm going somewhere. <laughs> Stay fit and healthy. Okay. Remember, staying fit and healthy isn't the same as going for a walk three days a week. That's a good start. Staying fit and healthy is pretty demanding. It's hard to do. Uh, number six, learn something new and exciting. Might be a language. Might be a skill, might be a sport, could be anything, a craft. Quit smoking, number seven, always a great idea. Eight, help others achieve their dreams. Nine, fall in love. I had no idea that was on the list. <laughs> fall, I've done that, so I recommend it highly. Uh, but I had no idea it was on the list. Spend more time with family. Do you notice anything about this list of ten? Two are for others, eight are for you. Eight are for you. Self-improvement. Self-improvement. I'm not putting it down. I want to be very clear. I'm not saying don't improve yourself. Don't do these things. These are good things to do. But here's the thing for us, and we're going to move into this in a moment, is as Christians, we know that it's not about us. All right? Love your neighbors as yourself. It doesn't say love your neighbors, but not yourself. Love yourself, but love your neighbors. So, so these are good. Improve yourself. But as Christians, we're called to something greater, aren't we? 
something beyond that. But I want to look at just the number one resolution so you know what you're up against, so you don't set yourselves up for failure this year, so they get realistic. I'm going to put a number on the screen. Yeah, that's right. 3,500 calories equals one pound. Now, I do triathlons. I don't, I'm not saying I do them well. I just do them. <laughs> and I ride a road bike. And I don't know if you know what it takes to ride a road bike 20 miles an hour for one hour. I do. It's not easy. If any of you think it is, you're mistaken. And in that time, you'll burn around 700 calories. So you know how many, let's do some math. How many of those rides do you have to take to take off six slices of key lime pie? Probably about five to seven of those. And yet, the day after Christmas, no, Christmas Day, I think it was, we're driving along the road by my house, two groups of people striding down the road, taking up the whole lane. I know exactly what they were doing. We're walking off our dinner, our food. They're doing a 40-minute walk, which should eliminate all the calories they took in. That's how we think sometimes. You see, we set ourselves up. If we don't know reality, we set ourselves up for failure, then we build a hierarchy of failures, which is not motivating. So I'm not trying to scourge you at all. Go ahead and make them, but by the end, I'm going to give you a way that you can increase your odds of keeping them that you may not have had. And there's something else that's really important that you get today. When we're talking about changing something serious enough to make your list of changing something, we have to understand it's a journey. You're charting a course. You're on a great adventure. What does adventure mean? What's adventure if it doesn't have obstacles and challenges and hard places and things you have to overcome? It's just the way it is. And it's really, really important. If you're going out fishing, it's, it's drift and current and storms and stuff floating in the water and engine failure and, and, and whales coming near the boat and uh, you know all kinds of things that can put you at risk. When you've set resolutions before, and when you're thinking about setting them now, what are the challenges you've faced? What's come along and been the current for you? What's come along and been the wind that came up and came right at you and slowed you down? What's been the engine failure? What's been the stuff that stopped you along the way? And here's another challenge. Could we see those things as good for us? There's a saying in boating, it says, smooth sailing never made a skilled sailor. Smooth sailing never made a skilled sailor. What we want is a smooth ride. When I set a new goal for myself, a new resolution, I got an X on the map, I'm going there, I want it smooth. I want it nice and easy. I just want to somehow end up there and go, wasn't this glorious? But I can understand it's a day-by-day, step-by-step journey. Not only go through it, but I got to learn to appreciate the other things built into that day-by-day, step-by-step. We want a smooth ride, and we usually get anything but. Anything but. We get all kinds of things. Do you know where you want to go in this coming year? Do you know where you're supposed to go? See the difference in that question? Do you know where you want to go? Do you know where you're supposed to go? See, I I read this book cover to cover many times, dog-eared a lot of pages, to figure out how I was going to be able to fish and have boats. I've had five boats, um, and it helped. That's where I wanted to go. When I want to know where I'm supposed to go, I've got to know this book. There's no way around it. I've got to know this book. The Bible has a lot to say about what God wants for us and where he wants us to go. There's some books in the Bible called the wisdom literature. And see, knowledge is the accumulation of facts and data. Wisdom for a believer is somehow getting closer to God's view of those facts and data and their use and their purpose and their meaning. So he's written wisdom in his book. We think of wisdom literature, Job, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, some of the Psalms. In the New Testament, we kind of see the book of James as wisdom literature. How to live, 
moral decisions, how to be, how to handle tough situations. But number one, I got to say, is Proverbs. Proverbs is used today by the secular world as well because it's brilliant. It's immediately accessible. You don't have to dig, dig, dig to sort of glean a meaning out of a proverb. It's like a nugget of gold sitting on a rock. And it's beautiful. We need to take full advantage of that as we chart a course for the coming year. As we get on this great adventure with hope and expectation, we need to do it right. And we need to start with God's book of wisdom. God's guidance is the first move the first move. In Proverbs 16, verse 3, it says, commit to the Lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed. The key there is commit to the Lord whatever you do. In order to know what to do, you need to know this book. You need to be in prayer. You need to say, Lord, I'm going to committing to you these things. They seem right by your word. They seem right by what I hear taught in my church and in my, in my prayer life. And your plans will succeed. Proverbs 16, 9. In his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. We plan. In a heart, it means our emotions and our feelings and all and our thoughts combined. We plan our course, but the Lord determines his steps. We have to allow him to determine the steps. Proverbs 21, 2, all a man's ways seem right to him, but the Lord weighs the heart. Here's what I think about when I think of the heart. I think about my own thoughts and feelings, deciding things, guiding my life, and if that's all I got, I can't tell you how much trouble I'm in. You wouldn't want to be in my head for five minutes. The things I think sometimes and, and the things that just go passing through like a freight train and, you know, feelings I have and, ah, it's just not good. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I am so grateful that Jesus lives in me. I am so grateful that according to the book of John, when Jesus was leaving and his followers were heartbroken, he said, no, 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 I'm going to leave the Holy Spirit with you. So I'm not left to just use Dennis's brain to make decisions on resolutions and goals. If I was, God help me. If you are, God help you. We have so much better than that because Bible-based resolutions help change hearts, starting with our own. There's something I've noticed in the last few years, and this could be just because I've been around a while. Uh, maybe you've noticed it too. It may be one of those generational things where Every generation gets to a certain point and observes what I'm going to share with you. But here's what I've observed. Some of it in my own family, certainly with people I know. Many, many, many of the younger generation want to be somewhere, but they don't want to journey there. I want to be this. I want to be lighter, be in better shape. I want to be an attorney. I want to be wealthy. I want to be successful. I want to own businesses. I want to, I want to be a doctor. I want to be all this. Okay, great, get started on the journey. Journey? Holy cow. That's a lot of work. Going there, that's the hard part. Getting there is the hard part. See, what we want is we want a fixed place. I'm going to a place, and I want to be there. But when we follow Jesus, it's not a fixed place. It's a fixed process. You see? What we don't want is Jesus following us. And I'm walking along going, all right, I'd like this, this, and that to happen. This, you just make it happen. Like the genie on television. The guy says, I want a million bucks. You see that? Look at all these deer all over the landscape. That's not what we're after. We follow him. He doesn't follow us. We follow him. So it's important to know the conditions that we're working with. It's important to be honest with ourselves, honest with our hearts, honest with our weaknesses, honest with our temptations, honest with our strengths, honest with our successes when we decide to make important changes. And by the way, I don't 
care a bit for New Year's Day as a day to make resolutions active. If something's worth doing, why in the world would we wait till Thursday? I'd love to do it today, but you can't. The rules are <laughs> Thursday, midnight Thursday. If you want to get an early start, that's ridiculous. We're followers of Christ. We can improve ourselves any given day. But you know what happens, right? When, with eating especially, I've done it. God knows I've done it. I make a resolution, therefore, and be it resolved. that as of January 1st, I shall no longer eat the foods I enjoy. I will eat foods I do not enjoy <laughs> for the purposes of dropping weight. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Because what do you do that? When you make that resolution, you go, pass the cookies. Because I now have permission to stuff myself until January 1. Even though your history shows you that the resolution doesn't work. You trick yourselves all over again. I do it. We're going to advocate for something different this morning. We are. Because one of the most beautiful gifts the Lord has given us is choice and freedom. If there's something worth doing, you can choose it right now. You can choose it today. And I'm not disrespecting the New York Times top 10 list of New Year's resolutions. They're worth doing. Go for it. You know, all power to you. But I want to add something. We can make better choices as we follow Christ in living outside of just ourselves. And I, I prayed about it and the Lord gave me five Proverbs and each one of these is going to have a fill-in in your bulletin. Five Proverbs. And from this list, I'm just thinking maybe you would take one and say, that's one I'm going to commit to. And, and let's walk through that and you will see. In your bulletin, there's a blank space under the fill-ins. I'd like you to be ready. I'm going to give you a challenge to write in that blank space in a few minutes. Proverbs 14, 31. He who oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker. But whoever is kind to the needy honors God. Here's your fill-in. Giving of ourselves. I want to camp for a minute on the word contempt. <laughs> I mean, it would be different, maybe, if it said, he who oppresses the poor, you know, kind of gives slight disappointment to God. Contempt is one of the most powerful words in the English language. Because contempt displayed in a relationship is corrosive and destructive and diseased contempt. And here it says, if we oppress the poor, we show contempt for our Father. How do you say that any more powerfully? So giving of ourselves, maybe that's the one that moves you. And you say, you know, I, I got to do more of that. I, I'm going to commit to that. Proverbs 15.1. And you probably know this one well. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The filling is curbing our tongues. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Had a fire in the fireplace last night, and I was noticing as I put another piece of wood in, I stirred it a little bit. And what happened? <laughs> Think of that in your mind when you have a harsh word. And here's what I've heard over the years from people. In counseling, I'm, I'm an MFT, and I've done psychotherapy and relationship counseling forever. And as a pastor, I hear the same thing. People say, it just comes out, Dennis. I don't know. I mean, you know, one of those guys, I just say it. I feel it, I say it. So I wish I could control it, but uh, people in my life have just had to get used to me not, to, used to me being the way I am. A harsh word pops out, I apologize. They got a problem with forgiving. It's, they're the ones with problems. <laughs> they don't forgive me rapidly and enough as I do this constantly. And yet these same people, I would say, so if a cop pulls you over, you give them harsh words? Oh, that's stupid. If you're in the doctor's, on the, on the, on the surgery table, you give everybody harsh words. If you're in the line checking in at the airport, you give them a piece of your mind. Really? See, the reality is nobody does it all the time. Everybody has some limit where they won't. I'm not going to, well, I would, but not this time. So it's a lie that you can't curb it. It's a lie that you can't contain it. 
but it needs to be stepped up to a commitment to change. And I'll tell you in a minute the steps we can take that increase the odds of that change. Curbing our tongue, Proverbs 16, 3. This is a repeat of what I said earlier. Commit to the Lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed. Your fill-in is a planning process steeped in prayer. I steeped some tea earlier this morning. Some of us are fighting a little cold. And as I watched it, I thought, that's it. You know, that's steeping what it does. You watch the bag in there. You don't go. You leave it in and you watch the goodness come out. And you can, you can make it darker and you can put more flavor in it. You steep it. Are we willing to commit to a process where our plans for the coming year are steeped in prayer? First and foremost. Proverbs 20, 22. This is just so important today. Do not say, I'll pay you back for this wrong. Wait for the Lord and he will deliver you. I need reminders of this all the time. Letting go of wrongs is your filling. Letting go of wrongs. There's parts of the world that you can read about every day where people won't let go of wrongs. And the death and destruction and desecration is unmeasurable. And it's all based on, well, you know what they did? Yeah, well, you know what they did? Yeah, well, you know what they did? I'm not letting go of that. And the Lord in his wisdom says, do you know what you'll reap if you don't do that? Whether it's in your family, whether it's in a relationship, in a coworker partnership, or in your neighborhood, maybe you got rough neighbors, anywhere. Do you know what happens if you don't learn to let go of wrongs? They stick with you and they become rocks in a backpack. And it starts to weigh you down and crush you. Are we willing to maybe make that one of ours? Resolutions for the coming year. Proverbs 25, verse 11. A word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. That's choosing the right words at the right time. Aptly. Aptly means the appropriate word designed to do the most good and be of the most benefit in that situation in that moment. That's what it means. Apples of gold. Settings of silver. It doesn't say a word aptly chosen is generally a good idea. It gives it the value of precious metals. We Imagine what your world would be like with just a few of these. Imagine the change that we could see around us if we take on this gentle answer proverb. If we take on this aptly, a word aptly spoken proverb, everything is a ripple effect. Everything has momentum. And see, we're beyond ourselves. We're following Jesus Christ. We're becoming more like Jesus. We have the opportunity as priests, you're all priests if you know Jesus as your savior. We have the opportunity to make huge differences in the lives of those next to us, in our own hearts, and then outward from there. Then they make differences. That's what can happen when we embrace days. Now I want to tell you what research says about the high, doing things in a way that give you the highest probability that you'll keep these. It's really simple, but this comes from secular psychological research on human behavior. Number one, number one, I'm going to encourage you to do that this morning right now. Write them down. Would you take a moment in the blank space b- below your Proverbs, in your bulletin, there's a reason for it being there, and be willing to select one of these Proverbs. Just write the proverb down. You can look it up later. Or something else on your mind and write it right down there, right now. And say, all right, I'm going to write it down. I'm starting a commitment. I see some of you writing all along there. Good. I've done that. I've written mine down. So number one, you write them down. Number two, you break them down into small, sometimes even tiny steps. See, we don't want to take the lose weight thing and say, my goal is to be 20 pounds lighter. All right. You got to break it down and say, my goal is to eat better tomorrow and exercise. I mean, we have to break these things down. If you use these proverbs here, think and pray about a way that you can break them down. Number three, here's where we come out of ourselves. Excuse me. We need to share them with at least four other people. Meaning you have to write them down and give it to them and ask them to keep it where they can read it and pray for it. 
Share them with four other people. Next, you have to select two of those people and ask them if they would be willing to be your accountability partners. And accountability means you give them, you empower them to check on you. Never beyond a week's time, hopefully more than once in a week. Would they be willing to, and you empower them to call you and ask you, how are you doing? This is secular learning behavior research that tells us these things increase the odds. I've added one of my own. Number five, celebrate victories daily. It's not going to be up there. Celebrate victories daily. Don't say, I'm going to celebrate when I've lost five pounds. Don't say, I'm going to celebrate when I've gone six months without using a harsh word. If you go tomorrow without a harsh word, at the end of the day, celebrate it. Praise God for it. In psych, the psych world, we call that building a victory hierarchy. Also, forget failures quickly. Too often we take a failure, it's so demoralizing and dispiriting that we end up just abandoning the goal. I can't do it anyway. We have to forget failures quickly. It's just as important as celebrating victories daily. I want to give you, here's a, here's a bonus point today. A bonus point. We have God's power helping us. If you don't know the Lord, if you're not in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you have whatever power you have as a human being. And God help you. But as a follower of Jesus, the word tells us that we have more than that. The apostle Paul, while in prison, imprisoned, several times, tortured a number of times, uh, sang hymns and brought people to Jesus. I just want to say for a moment, when we look at just one of his scourgings where they gave him the 39 lashes and he had scars all over his back, you've had cuts, you've had abrasions and wounds, you know how long a scar takes to form? Do you know how painful that would have been for him? Are we aware that he didn't go to the ER? He didn't get morphine. He didn't get any of the stuff we have today. The suffering is almost incomprehensible. The pain would be beyond anything we'll ever know. And in the midst of it, he preached the word of God and sang hymns and drew people to Jesus Christ. And how did he do it? He tells us in Philippians 4, 13. This is for us as well. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Paul didn't do it on his own power. He was very, very clear about it. He goes on in Romans to say more about it. It's a great doxology. It's a great benediction. Romans chapter 15, verse 13, it says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus left in John, the book of John, and said, I leave you the Holy Spirit. The Greek word for power is dunamis. It means special, miraculous power or force. Do you believe this morning that you have that power available to you? God's word says it's true. It worked for Paul. It's available to us. We just ask, just open our hearts and receive. Do you believe that you can make a resolution that you can keep if you follow these simple steps and you begin with prayer, a process steeped in prayer, and that when you keep it, as you keep it, day by day, and celebrate the daily victories, you will begin to see the changes in other people's lives as we give ourselves away, and the changes in your own heart. My hope and prayer today is that you believe that. I believe it with all my heart. If I didn't, my pastoring would be severely limited and my counseling would stop. Why bother? This is true and this is real. That's my encouragement to you today. If you'll make one, if you'll write something down, trust that you have a power available to you to have incredible success in the year that comes. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this truth. Truth in your word that we are reflecting on the year that came before. We are anticipating the year that's approaching. That date somehow is significant. It is. 
But Lord, we're so grateful that your mercies are new every morning. They're not renewed once a year. Your forgiveness is new every morning. Your grace is sufficient every day. We have power, Father, beyond our own. If we will simply know your book, be steeped in prayer, and be guided to the choices, we have every expectation that those changes will come and our hearts will be blessed and others will be nourished and brought, brought closer to the light and the love and the hope of Jesus, Father. We're banking on it. And we thank you that you give us this this morning. I pray that for every one of us in this room this morning, Lord God. We walk out with a sense of hope and a positive um, outlook and, and look forward to success and victory in you. And I pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.